to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the people of Israel, God said, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse number 10. Welcome to our study of the book of Ezekiel. As we survey these living messages of the Old Testament, we find ourselves today in the book of Ezekiel, which is a book that depicts the power, the majesty, and the sovereignty of God over His people Israel, who, according to God's standpoint and from God's standpoint, looks like they're headed down the path that is going to lead to their destruction, no doubt due to captivity and their own sin, and God is pleading with these people to get their life right, to realize He's the only true and living God, the source of salvation, and to rekindle that relationship with Him through their penitence and their desire to do the will of God. As we mentioned, the key phrase to the book of Ezekiel, and it's found some 66 times in the book, is, "...they shall know." that I am the Lord. The events that occur, the power and the majesty of God that is seen, His heartfelt pleas to these people are all designed to help them see God is the true God. He is the one who is sovereign over their lives and they must submit to Him. Another unique phrase that occurs in the book of Ezekiel is the phrase, Son of Man. This phrase occurs some 93 times in the book and, and we'll liken this unto Jesus as He sees Himself, both God and man. He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4 verse 15, and Ezekiel, although being a man, speaks on behalf of God a message of repentance to the people of Israel. Key word in the book is the word glory. This occurs 24 times and especially a key pivotal point in the book, chapters 10 and 11, the glory of God goes above the cherub, it goes above the temple, and then eventually God's glory departs from the people of Israel, showing the progression, the, the, the progression God took in removing Himself from His people who would not listen nor change their ways. A couple of other key ideas. In the book, you will hear the word watchman. This would be someone who is constantly on guard, like a, a security guard, like someone in a military force watching a camp. This is the person who looks out for the enemy and tries to warn. Ezekiel is seen as the watchman of God's people and then no doubt the idea of repentance is a key idea in the book in that this is what God is striving to get His people to see. Key verse that we mention is found in Ezekiel chapter 33 and listen to the words of verse number 11. Say to them, God says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but here's what God wants, that the wicked turn from his way and live. Here's God's passionate plea. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? You know, when we think about God's relationship with Israel. And when we hear God's words to Israel here, God says, I've got no pleasure when wicked people die. It's not as though I'm an a evil God who wants everybody to die and go to hell. That's not the way God thinks. God says, I've got no pleasure in this. Here's what I want. I want you to turn from your evil ways. And so God says, turn, O my people, and live. What is it that the God of heaven wants from men and women today? Well, realizing that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and realizing that the wages of that sin is death, 
Ezekiel 18, 4, the God of heaven wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God's not slow concerning His promises. Peter says, as some men count slowness, but rather He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, a clear picture of this is seen in what we might depict as one of the key pivotal chapters in the book in Ezekiel chapter 33. We have this grand scene of this valley of dry bones and, and the breath of God begins to enter that valley. Those dry bones begin to put sinew and flesh and muscle back together, skin, and, until they're rebuilt. And the picture is, if Israel, whose spiritual and social state, governmental state, is like a valley of dry bones, if they'll let God re-enter them, and if they'll get their life right, God can rebuild this nation to what He intended for it to be. When we think about the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet himself plays a very pivotal role in understanding the book. The name Ezekiel means strength of or from God. Ezekiel indeed represented a true source of strength for the people if they would heed and obey his message. Ezekiel was both a prophet and a priest in his lineage, we learn that in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 3, he began prophesying somewhere around the age of 30 and prophesied about 22 years. Some believe that somewhere around 592 to 570, he finds himself in the midst of captivity, encouraging these people, trying to bring them back and get them out of that valley of dry bones to the state God wanted them to be. You know, when we think about Ezekiel, he's a very unique prophet in that he was a contemporary with two other great prophets, both Daniel and Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. All three of these prophets played a role in the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel each playing a part in encouraging and trying to rebuild the nation of Israel spiritually. Now, we know of Ezekiel that he was a very brave and a very bold preacher of God in that he was willing, even among difficult circumstances, to say what God wanted him to say. For example, notice Ezekiel chapter 2. Verse number 5, God says, As for them, of Ezekiel, He says, Whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. If Ezekiel did his job correctly, and he was going to, he had that intent, God says, they'll know you've been my prophet and that you were among them. Now, this doesn't mean that Ezekiel didn't face circumstances that caused him problems. This doesn't mean that Ezekiel didn't have difficulties he had to face. He had some very difficult personal experiences. For example, he was told by God in Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, to lie on his left side, then on his right side, representative 430 days, representative of 430 years. Can you imagine doing that? Lying that long on one side, then on the other, representative of God's captivity of the people, the 430 years. And then, of course, according to Ezekiel 24, 18, Ezekiel's wife also died during this time frame, and no doubt that was difficult for him. Now let's take for just a moment and think about the setting of where Ezekiel's message is being received at and how that relates to the book itself. Ezekiel and the people were taken captive during what we know as the second deportation. 607, 606 period was the first deportation by Nebuchadnezzar. Then you've got one in 597, then one later in 586. And so you've got three ways of deportation by Babylon and Ezekiel and the captives are taken away in this second deportation. We learn from the outset of the book that Ezekiel is by the river Chebar, which today is known as the modern area of Tel Aviv. He's five years into an evil king's captivity, King Jehoiakim. He's five years into that, which places it somewhere around the time frame of 592. And so 
here they are. They're the second group to go into captivity, representing more persecution and problems coming on the people due to sin. They're in an unknown land under the rule of an ungodly king, and all of this was designed to help them put their trust not in men, but back in the Almighty God. Now that we have some background and setting to the book, let's take just a moment and think about some of the practical messages that we find in the book of Ezekiel. And, and as we do, let's think toward an eye toward applying that today as well. The first lesson that jumps off the pages of Ezekiel for us is the watchman principle. This occurs in chapter 3 and in chapter 33. And I want you to notice what God says in Ezekiel chapter 3 beginning in verse 17. God says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. God says, When I say to the wicked, You shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but... His blood I'll require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Here's God's basic principle. Ezekiel is set up as a watchman. He's a prophet of God and he says, here's your job. Your job is to cry out, to warn, to tell of the impending doom and destruction. And if you don't do that, I want to require the man who dies, I'm going to require his blood at your hand. But if you do, and he dies anyway, hey, he heard the warning, you did his part, I'm not going to require his blood at your hands. Now, as we think about the Christian today, and as we think about the very simple fact that sin is enslaving so many people today, Romans 6, 17 through 19, and that, that people who are in sin desperately need to hear the message of salvation. Isn't there a practical application to be drawn here? Have I not, and have Christians not been given the Great Commission? They indeed have. Jesus said, go into all the world. And who do we preach the gospel to? Preach the gospel to every creature. Our responsibility is simply to sow the seed. Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 8, we're to sow the word of God. My responsibility, I'm not responsible, nor can I control who decides to obey, who decides to be baptized. I can't dictate, nor can I control that. But I do have the responsibility of preaching the Word. And so if we preach the Word, if we sow the seed, if we tell others about the message, we've done God's will. But if we sit back and if we know there are people lost in sin and we never say anything, would it not be the case that since God has told us to take the gospel to all men and we spurn that invitation, would we not also be accountable for those things. We learn another very practical lesson from Ezekiel chapter 6 and verse 9, and this has to deal with Israel's sin and no doubt ours as well. Did you know that sin breaks the heart of God? Look in Ezekiel chapter 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 9. Scripture records, then those of you who escape, God says, will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive, watch this, because I was crushed by their adulterous heart, which is departed from me, and by their eyes, which play the harlot after their idols, they will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed in all their abominations. You know, when I think about God and His character and His nature, God Himself it, it breaks the heart of God. It, it deeply grieves. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit is grieved. We know that you can vex the Spirit. Ephesians tells us about that. But it breaks the heart of God. God says, I was crushed by their adulterous hearts. Why was it that that crushed God? And in what sense? Well, in this sense, in that God made man in His own image. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, in that God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. In that from Genesis chapter 3, the point of sin, God has been desperately working to reclaim that which is His own and to, and to work with the people of Israel, to guide them along by the hand many times, and then in essence, have them stab God in the back. No doubt, God was crushed by their adulterous heart. And yet, friend, doesn't that apply to us today as well? Hasn't God done so much for us? Look at where we are today compared to Israel. We're no longer being led along by the hand by God in the sense that we're looking forward to something better. We're living in the full age of Christianity today, in the fullness of the blessing of God's Son, the atoning sacrifice, and the, and the realization of what that cost. And when I turn on my back on God, and when I give in to sin, friend, don't you know that God also today is crushed when we sin against Him? That it, it hurts God deeply, and that God doesn't want us to live a life of sin. You know, another practical lesson that we learn from the book of Ezekiel is kind of the progressive nature of sin and God's departure because of that. Let me share with you three passages. Look in your Bible. In Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3, the Scripture says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where, had it, where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And so here God's glory departs to the cherub, to the threshold of the temple. Okay. Now look in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse number 4. The scripture says, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Now, Ezekiel chapter 10, look in verse number 18 now. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And then, of course, Ezekiel chapter 10, verse number 28 and following, we now have God's glory completely departing from the people of Israel. And so God's working with them. God is, being, God is a patient God. But look at how God eventually has to completely remove Himself from the people of Israel. Friend, we learn here that sin does cause a definite separation between God and man. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, the Bible says, The, the Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms not short that He cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated your God from you, or you from your God. And so sin causes a separation. If I remain in that, and I continue in that, and my heart is hardened in that, Oh, what a desperate and difficult situation that a person finds himself in. Now I want you to notice Ezekiel chapter 11, verse number 19. And, and this is what God is trying to get His people to do, to gain a, a new heart, to change their ways, and turn to Him. Look at Ezekiel 11, verse 19. God tells them, if they will change, God says, then I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them, take the stony heart of their flesh, and give them, uh, take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. Here's what God's wanting them to do to turn, to change, to make themselves like clay in the hand of the potter in Jeremiah 18, and, and to put back in them the kind of heart. God wants them to have. You know, a, a lot of our relationship with God is about having the right type of heart. We're not talking about the blood pump. We're talking about the mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23 and verse 7. Jesus would often condemn the Pharisees and Sadducees. Their heart is not, your heart is not right in the sight of God. They would say, repent or perish. Luke 13 would teach us those principles. And so, as I think about my life and as I think about my relationship with God, I want to make sure that my heart is right, that I have a pure desire to only do what God says, and that as I live, as I walk, and as I strive to be an example for Christ, that I'm letting the Bible 
be my sole guide in everything that I say and that I do. Let's think of then about some more practical lessons from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 14 shows us the extent of Israel's sin. Notice this short little text with me. Ezekiel 14 verse 14 the scripture says, Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, were in the city of Jerusalem, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. You know, when we think about Israel's state, look at how far they had come. Great men such as Noah, who preached to the world of ungodliness during the time of the flood. Great men like, like Daniel, who's doing a work as well in the time of captivity. And we remember the great stories of him in the lion's den and how he stood for right. And then Job, a great man of perseverance and faith. God says, if these three men were here, they could only save themselves. Think about the state Israel had reached. And friend, realize this. Here's the practical lesson. It's possible to so harden one's heart that it makes the Word of God very difficult to penetrate. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 following says, We can have our conscience seared with a hot iron. You know the idea of searing, when you sear something, you create a hard shell over what you're trying to get to. Well, that's true when it relates to man's heart spiritually. If I'm constantly overcoming or if I'm constantly being overcome by sin, if I don't make any attempt to get out of it, if when I hear the Word of God preached I don't let it into my heart, I'm building callous on top of callous on top of callous. And it makes it very difficult for the Word of God to prick my heart as it ought to. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Now I want you to notice another passage from the book of Ezekiel that, that teaches us about the personal nature and responsibility of sin. Look in Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 and then in verse 20. The scripture says in verse 4, Behold, God says, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Notice this, the soul who sins shall die. Now, how personal is the responsibility? Well, I understand there that if the soul sins, it's that soul who dies. Each of us have a soul, and so I'm responsible for what I do. Now, look a little further in verse number 20 of that same text. Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the Bible says, The soul who sins shall die. Now notice an explanation. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. What's God saying here? Well, you've got to understand the context. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, Israel had this proverb. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In essence, they were saying the fathers ate something sour and the children tasted in their own mouth. Well, God says don't use that proverb in Israel anymore. Why not, God? The soul who sins shall surely die and son shall not bear the guilt of the father nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. What practical lesson do we learn from that text? Friends, sin isn't passed on. It's, it's, there's this idea of inherited sin. Friend, you just don't find that in the Bible. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The soul who sins shall surely die. And God says, don't use any proverbs or teaching lessons that indicate Sin is passed on from one generation to the next. Such is not the case. And so while it may be popular among many today, the idea of sin being inherited, you just don't find that teaching in the Scripture. In fact, we find that we all have a choice. Joshua 24 verse 15, that we are made in the image of a pure and holy God. Genesis chapter 2 verses 6 and 7, and that we all, at one time or another, have chosen the path of sin. Romans 3.23 and Romans chapter 3 verse number 10. Now, let me show you another passage to illustrate that sin is not inherited. Look in Ezekiel chapter 28 and I want you to notice verse number 15. Ezekiel chapter 28 
Notice what the text says in verse number 15. To the king of Tyre, Ezekiel 28, verses 11 and 12, God says, You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. What do we know about this evil, ungodly king? God says you were perfect in all your ways, adverb of time, until iniquity was found in you. Even this man, he was created upright in the sight of Almighty God, and he had a, a, a choice to hear and obey, or a choice not to hear and to disobey. He chose the wrong path but he still had that choice. Now, one last passage that I want you to notice from the book of Ezekiel, and that's Ezekiel chapter 33. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 30. Notice the peril of not listening, the danger of not listening to the Word of God. In Ezekiel chapter 33, in verse 30, the Scripture says this, As for you, Son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. Now notice God says, So they come to you as my people do. They sit before you as my people do. They hear your words. Now notice but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. What a troubling text that is. Yes, God says, they say, hey, the prophet's here, let's listen. And they all gather around to listen. But in essence, God says, nobody listens and nobody changes when they hear my voice. Friend, how today, as we hear the voice of God, we need to make those changes. Is your life really right with God? Have you obeyed the gospel? The Bible says you must hear the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17, having heard that Word, you must believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14 6, having believed, are you willing to repent? Luke 13 3, would you make that great confession? Acts chapter 8 verse 37 through 39, and would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus said it this way, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, we hope today that you obey the gospel and hear God's voice before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Like we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ.